Enigma. So, uh, <laughs> the, the content of my channel so far has been relatively niche, but this, this is something special. So I'm gonna assume you already know who this dumbass is and what an iceberg chart is. But for Terra Enigma's sake, I'm still gonna give spoiler warnings just in case. Please play the fucking video game! I'm going to be spoiling pretty much every aspect of Terranigma, and it's it's like a 20 hour commitment. It's not too bad, and it is worth it, I promise. This iceberg was originally done by Simply Holy on Reddit. I'll leave the original link in the description and his Twitch account. In fact, I'll be leaving everything in the description this time, which means all of the sources I looked at so you too can also dive down this accursed rabbit hole. There's a petition to get Terranigma archived and released digitally, whether that's a port or a full remake. Kamui Fujiwara, the game's main artist and character designer, Miyoko Kobayashi, one of the game's composers, and Kisato are all involved with the petition. Kisato is a fan who's been holding the Resurrection of the Hero Fest event every year for the past six years to celebrate Terra Enigma's anniversary. The petition is planned to be presented to Square Enix, but as this video takes longer and longer to come out, we'll see where it's gone to when that happens. Even though the petition itself is entirely in Japanese, Rekka Alexiel, also an incredible fan on Twitter, has translated it and made everything super convenient to access on their site, which will also be in the description. Anyone can sign it, even anonymously. So so please, I am gently persuading you to go do so. I'll specify on screen which entries were contributed by whom, since a few were added to a second version of the iceberg, and I've added some of my own entries. I've also moved some entries, so the video won't go exactly how the chart has them, but all of the listed entries are in here somewhere. And here we go. Welcome to the Terranigma iceberg. Let's dive in. Hollow Earth. The very first thing the game shows you is exposition text over images of a desolate looking planet. It has all of our real world equivalent continents, but is said to be a hollow sphere with an internal and external face. The Gaia Stone, which is functionally the sun, is even the core on the game's box art. In game, the world map is actually a donut shape or a torus for all you math people out there. Cadet Sexy Look. Cadets are these ghost enemies that are only found in the beginning chapter of the game. They can hit you with a look that either immobilizes you for a few seconds, makes nothing happen, or it gets reflected back at them. Sometimes though, the text will instead say, Cadet cast a sexy look. It's not a different attack or anything, just a fun piece of text you may or may not encounter. Sonic the Hedgehog reference? No, no, not explicitly. Uh, but maybe. Ark has a surprising amount of personality conveyed entirely through his animations, including his idols. Yeah, he's definitely as impatient as Sonic. The blue blur has gotta go fast. Macho appeal. After completing the five towers in the underworld, you can enter a secret cave located here, west of Tower 5. Getting through this cave resurrects Polynese, which you can visit on the overworld here. The only things on the island are a couple of NPCs and beach chairs to lay on. Napping here will leave Ark sunburnt when he wakes up and an increase to his macho appeal. Macho appeal doesn't actually do anything, it's just another little fun piece of easter egg text. And no, the girls in freedom don't do anything for you either. Resurrecting Moo Continuing with secret areas, there's another island you can unlock on the overworld after finding it in the underworld. This secret cave north of Tower 3 holds a control room that resurrects Mu, an area from Terranigma's predecessor, Illusion of Gaia. Reaching Mu on the overworld grants you one of the four special weapons, the Enbu Pike. It's a decently powerful endgame spear, though I find it more interesting that it has a similar look to Terranigma's final boss. Not sure if that or the name of the spear means anything, though. The text. As you can tell just by looking at it, the text in this game is not ideal. I don't mean the translation or actual dialogue, but the way the dialogue is presented. Supposedly, there was little effort to reprogram the way text displays to accommodate for all the non-Japanese versions. Wide text, the windows having an extra line just to fit all of it, and plenty more technical issues not present in the Japanese version according to my one source, but I'm really not equipped to understand much of it, even if I were to go back to it with a fine-toothed comb. One of the most obvious things, however, is that a lot of location names are shortened to fit the eight character limit. Sanctuary is Sanctuar, Evergreen is Eve Green, Sylvain Castle is just Castle, Southern Europe is s -year. you get the point. There are plenty of instances of typos and text getting cut off too. Cape Town. Traveling past the tip of Africa prompts the location text Cape Town and Kalahari to appear. It was one of Terranigma's early mysteries as to what Cape Town was or if it was accessible in any way. 
I mean, it's such a large stretch of land, and Cape Town is a real place that Ark could have visited. Using cheats, however, there's nothing past the mountains. No towns, no sub-areas. There were rumors of it being the location of the 100th Magirock, which is not true by the way, there were only 97 Magiroks in the game. But it's more likely there for the sake of putting real-world names to locations, and perhaps a nod to Illusion of Gaia's South Cape Town, which is also located at the southern tip of a continent. Talking Squirrel Up to a certain point in Terradigma, you can talk to various plants and animals. Once humans are resurrected, this is no longer possible, but supposedly there is a single squirrel in the war that you can talk to. Not true, actually. There is a dog in Loire upon arrival, but no, can't talk to him. Nor at any stage of Loire's expansions are there any more animals. After humans are resurrected though, there are still a few animals that have regular dialogue. A merchant bird in Sanctuar, and on this tile in Europe, south of Lyoto, are these two kangaroo rats who you can race for a Magirock. The bird actually makes sense. He has text for when Ark can still understand animals, and even after Ark can't talk to them, We're just gonna disregard the fact that this is one of the most powerful beings in the whole game. The rats though, I'm not sure. My guess is that because this area is entirely missable, if you came here for the first time after resurrecting humanity, you wouldn't know what this area is for. But why not place a sign? I was already able to talk to plants and animals, would it be that much weirder if they could read and write? Throwing objects. It's not unknown at all that you can throw pots and crops at people in Krista, and a lot of them even have dialogue for when it happens. Though, after leaving Krista, it seems like no one else in the game even has a reaction to Village Troublemaker Ark's constant property damage. You can throw pots in Dragoon Castle if there are any near a breakable wall, and it'll make a sound to reflect that. And strangely, even when you're back in Krista during Endgame, you can destroy the spirits of the villagers by throwing pots at them. but not much besides those two instances. There is, however, one spot where you can trigger something unique by throwing pots. This house in Lyoto has a woman and a monkey in it. If you're a monster for some reason and throw the pot at the monkey, the woman will yell at you for animal abuse and kick you out of the house permanently. Seriously, you can't enter the house for the rest of the game. I mean, you kinda deserve it. Chicken races. On a singular tile located here in Europe, you can bet on chicken races. It's really not an ideal way to get quick money, but it's a fun little thing. Almost no one seems to know what this kid's deal is, though. That's all he does! Even this girl sees that it's weird! There is a single other chicken fenced off, though. Is that Catherine? Actually, it probably is. Apparently, there's a chicken called Catherine in another Quintet game called Robotrek, or Slapstick in Japan. Go figure! Still don't know what it means. Massage Tent At various points in the game, you can find a group of nomads on the map called the Quattros. In one of their tents, there's a girl who asks you to massage her back in exchange for gems. If you do it from the front, however... Enix References there are a few references to what was just then called Enix throughout Terranigma. The one in Yunko is the most obvious with the neon lights outside the Magirock shop. There's another in Neo Tokyo. The sign above what I guess is an empty office building for Enix says, Enix News, Dragon Quest VI coming soon. Slime slime. And the least obvious one being in the mountains to the east of Loire. Seems like the only thing here is a Magirock, but the word Enix is sneakily hidden among the ground tiles. Gaia Trilogy Soul Blazer, Illusion of Gaia, and Terranigma are all unofficially considered a trilogy due to them sharing many similarities. I'm not going to cover all of them in the interest of keeping this video under an hour, but this is still going to be a bit of a lengthy section. In all three games, reincarnation is a big thing. Every living being goes through it, and there's a continually reincarnated legendary hero who is destined to save the world over and over again. They all have thematic ties, such as human ambition, environmentalism, the duality of light and dark, or otherwise two fundamental opposing forces, and what is probably the biggest theme the one that drives the design of these games, is destruction and creation. Similar items can be found at the games, such as the Phoenix Magic and Soul Blazer and Illusion of Gaia, now being the hero, spear, and armor in Terranigma. There are NPCs that share names as well, such as Service the Dolphin and Soul Blazer, him and Nana in Illusion of Gaia, and again in Terranigma. Some characters don't share names, but have obvious equivalents, such as King Magrade and King Henry, and Dr. Leo and Baruga. There are story aspects that you could use to connect these games as well, but to be honest, this is where things get iffy, at least for me. You could connect them, but the games don't have anything explicit to support that. They're all perfectly self-contained
side stories and in no way are any of them direct sequels. They do all have some kind of image of a god and devil, whether or not they are called that or are the same across these games, I don't know, but they could be the same beings in Illusion of Gaia and Terra Enigma. The comet in Illusion of Gaia changed the layout of Earth at the end of the game and turned it into our Earth, which we see in Terra Enigma. The comet's previous passings could account for the differences in the planet's layout across the games. There is plenty more I could talk about, but honestly, I find some of these other aspects to be really weak links between these games. I'm also going to throw this bit from an interview with Koji Yokoda, who was involved with Actraiser, Illusion of Gaia, Robotrek, and Grandstream Saga, that in the director's mind, although these games have a common thread, no question about that, Terra Enigma is different from them. What I've taken away from all of this is that it's just as open-ended as these games are by themselves, and if you want to make your own conclusions, I can at least point you to the video in the description that fueled the majority of my confusion. It's interesting, I promise, I just don't have the brains for this. Act Razor. Okay, I guess we're gonna talk about Act Razor now. Though, honestly, I wouldn't say Act Razor is connected to Terra much at all. If anything, it seems to have the most connections to Soul Blazer. They both involve the opposing fundamental forces, God and Devil slash Satan. We'll call him Satan since that's what he's called in the Japanese version of Act Razor, but in English, he is known as Tantra and God is known as the Master. The Master appears in Soul Blazer as well, though he simply guides Blazer after sending him down to restore the world, rather than animating a statue as an avatar himself, like in Act Razor. The God Gaia that guides Will in Illusion of Gaia is also an animated statue. Actraiser has very prevalent themes of death, rebirth, and creation and destruction as well, if anything is going to link all of these games together. Again though, there are far too many individual references to go over, so I'll leave a link in the description for all of those. No, I'm not going to talk about Actraiser 2, the iceberg does not mention it, and besides, I... I am scared to play these. Humans are bad. I mean, that goes without saying just playing through the game, but look at the differences in the cutscenes when you resurrect animals and plants. New life dawns, emerging from nothing, restoring the planet to its once lush state. Alright, what happens when humans are brought back? Well then. And as you progress through the game, you help almost all of the major towns develop, some being small agrarian societies and progressing all the way to computers, telephones, TVs, skyscrapers, airplanes. People find happiness through mass-produced material possessions, and money is now the only thing that could grant you any kind of freedom. Some people don't like how much everything has changed, and they wish they could go back to farming, being among nature rather than a cold, lifeless apartment. Some have lost their creative drive because they are now like machines working against time and money instead of doing what they want to do. You know. Like modern day! Might I also remind everyone that Ark was in deep sleep for three years after defeating Dark Morph, and that was all the time humanity needed to create economic inequality! There's also the fact that animals are exploited by humans as soon as you bring them back, and it makes it even more impactful when you were the one who saved the animals and formed a bond with them in the first place. You could find King Bird locked in a cage in the black market under Freedom's weapon shop, but if you pay up 5,000 gems, you can get a magic rock from him in Sanctuar. In Safarium, however, I can't say exactly when this happens in the game, I'd guess after Baruga is resurrected, at some point you'll see that all the animals are gone. They've all been taken to a newly built zoo in the Sun Coast. 
All except Liam, who you of course meet in the Neo Tokyo sewers, and it is entirely this guy's fault. The fact that he's gone from a child to an adult, how long has it been? Whose bones are down here? Even Ark falls into it eventually. Chapter 2 with the goat scene, Ark can't bring himself to eat the meat even in a life or death situation. Then in Chapters Beyond, once humans are brought back, Ark helps Mick to invent the hamburger, and there are plenty of all-you-can-eat restaurants like this that Ark has no qualms about. He would eat whole flowers if he could stomach it. It is worth mentioning the plants too. Obviously the more that the towns develop, the more land is now going to be occupied by buildings. Plenty of things are built out of wood and or plants and maybe it's for the better that we can't hear what they have to say about that. Meeting the developers. This is a well-known easter egg, but it's still a really fun bit. Go to Neo Tokyo and check this trash can. There's someone inside and choosing to help them brings you to this messy room to fight a ghost. Defeating the ghost releases a chicken representing the director and scenario writer Tomiyoshi Miyazaki, who is sleeping in the company crash pad. He says he'll make a game with you as the hero and boom, Quintet's building opens up. You can talk to a bunch of Terranigma's devs here. Composers, programmers, graphic designers, planners, even the president. And a lot of them have some pretty real commentary about working in game development. The president and Miyazaki both refer to the game they're developing as Illusion of Gaia 2, which, oh god, is like a whole thing, and I'm sure I'll be talking about that in later entries. Early Neo Tokyo. Supposedly, once you resurrect the birds and can fly across the overworld with them, you can get to Neo Tokyo before you've even resurrected humanity. Uh, this one isn't true either. You can fly to three places before you resurrect humans. Windvale, Safarium, and Kamio. Kamio's the island where Neo Tokyo will be located, but nothing is there until, again, humans are resurrected. King Henry's Massacre. Examining the books in the Library of Loire Castle reveals the awful campaign that King Henry led years ago, which is also alluded to by other NPCs. Hidden in Stockholm was a treasure that the king was looking for, but he chose to have everyone executed for rebelling and not telling him where the treasure was. The despair and fury of the villagers' souls lived on as the wolves that now inhabit Stockholm. Of course, Princess Elle was the only survivor, since she had the secret of the treasure vested in her by her parents, and was adopted by the king to eventually reveal the secret. The secret of Pandora's box, which has the arms of the hero, the hero armor and the hero pike that you get later in the game. The king, a pawn of Dark Gaia, wanted to get his hands on them before Ark could. This whole thing is of course a huge plot point since it explains Fida's obligation to Princess Elle, Elle's parents being killed, and the whole setup with finding a groom, Elle then killing the king when she recovers her past, and King Henry only being a part of the equation with Wong, Baruga, and Dark Gaia's plans. It involves Light Ark too since that was his village and it's theorized that Light Ark could have died along with the others in the village. Quintet Quiz. There's a lot more unused content in Terranigma than I thought, though not all of it is as interesting as the rest. There's standard debug stuff. A sound test. And some unused items. These include aloe leaves, a carrot and heaven statue, neither of which have sprites, a grass whistle, airplane parts, a grenade, a beeper, and an item called powered gear. I would guess that most of these items were made redundant after other things were added instead, like the Powered Gear's description saying it allows you to lift heavy objects. The most Ark can lift are crops and pots, and there's no need to lift something like a rock or a certain plant since you can destroy it with the rock spear. 
The airplane parts were obviously for helping Will, but in the final game, you leave Dragoon Castle with no parts. Will just kinda has them afterwards, since taking care of Wong made metal prices go down. Some of these other items could have been for Town Quest 2, but that's besides the main point for the century. The Quintet Quiz! In the Quintet building in Neo Tokyo, there was a true or false question quiz you could take to earn a Magirock. This quiz is in the Japanese version, but along with the Magirock you would get, it was made inaccessible in every other version. French, German, and Spanish text for the quiz exists in those versions, you just can't play it normally. The English version doesn't have any text for the quiz, but still has a line for Actraiser in the data that would have only been used in the quiz. The quiz is also different in each version. Robotrek was never released in Europe, so the German and French versions replaced any questions about it with Nintendo-themed questions. The German version especially also replaced a lot of other questions seemingly at random, like a question originally about Illusion of Gaia's character designs being drawn by a female mangaka was turned into Secret of Mana can be played by five players at a time. There's another one that's answered false in the German version about not needing dog biscuits in Secret of Evermore. That one is definitely incorrect because holy fuck this first fight is unfair. And a question in the French version about Luigi's hairy knees. I. I I mean, it's not considered true. <laughs> Moving on. Rococo Apartment. Once Loire is fully expanded, you can go to the Second Avenue to buy a key to your own apartment for 800 gems. You can even buy furniture for 100 gems each next door. A rug, bookshelf, table, dresser, and a bed. You can rest and save your game here, and it's kind of nice that Ark has somewhere to call home after being away from Krista for so long. Real world locations. Like I mentioned earlier, at least in the way Terranigma's Earth is laid out, it's close enough to real Earth. Almost every location also has a real world counterpart, and a map made by this person on Twitter lists every location in the game. Again, I can't go through all of them, but here are some that have close matches. Sylvain Castle is the Segovia Fortress. It's been used as a royal palace, a state prison, a royal artillery college, and a military academy. Just like how the game portrays Christopher Columbus and how the castle is filled with the vengeful spirits of Queen Isabella I and her staff, uh, yeah, totally. Close enough. The portraits are a nod to a real thing, though. There's a painting of the Queen's coronation in everyone's eyes. Yeah, they're totally black. It's because the coronation happened on St. Lucy's Day. St. Lucy is a patron saint of the blind because some versions of her story involve her eyes being removed. Yeah, I wasn't expecting such a history lesson either. Lhasa is literally Lhasa. It's the capital of Tibet, one of the highest cities in the world and home to multiple significant Buddhist sites. Real Lhasa has a semi-arid climate, so it doesn't get a whole lot of precipitation, but it's not impossible for it to look the way that it does in-game. The whole town in-game is built of stone, and I guess from what I looked at, you know, it's a really stripped-down representation, but it's fine enough. And our last one, the portal, which is said to match up with Lake Guadavita. Visually, maybe, if the lake's surroundings were a barren wasteland. But hey, it pretty much is a huge pit surrounded by mountains and with the nearby Tomine Reservoir. It looks enough like Kamui Fujiwara's art of Ark's first view outside the portal. Now, I don't know where this description on the site comes from, because as far as I can tell, this lake is super famous for being the basis of the El Dorado legend, but that's cool too. Mei Lin, Mei Ho, and Perel's disappearances. At the end of Baruga's lab tower, Ark has to catch Baruga before he takes off in his airship, and is helped by side characters Mei Lin, Mei Ho, and Perel. Ultimately, they're all separated, and they aren't mentioned past that point, so it's not known what happened to them. Hidden Sewer Door in Dragoon Castle. This one I'm honestly not sure what it's referring to, but there are two possibilities. One is while you're escaping Dragoon Castle, Ark is stopped by Mei Lin in the sewer even though it looks like the path goes further. Dragoon Castle is also not accessible past this point, so there's no way to go back and see if anything's there. Looking at the whole map for this area, there is a path on the right side, but it leads to nothing. And I know, this entry refers to a sewer door, but there isn't a door here. There is a hidden door somewhere else though. At least, the possibility of a door. It's actually right before this area, while you still have L with you and Meilin is leading the way out. This path here leads to this room, and it looks like one of those walls you can run into with the speed shoes. It doesn't break open, but attempting to do so does prompt a reaction from Meilin as if it were any other door. Hmm...
Royd's friends. It's only mentioned twice in the game that Royd had a friend who died to one of the game's villains, depending on who you want to blame, and that he intended to avenge them. Nothing else is known about them, but I don't think the details are important to the overall story. I'd say it's to make Royd realize our hero's goals aren't so different from his own when he encounters Fida in Dragoon Castle. Light Side Arc Light Arc is the hero you never play as. He was created by Light Gaia to defeat Dark Gaia and end their eternal conflict, which he succeeded in doing, but died in the process. Collecting the Star Stones near the end of the game brings back his spirit so that he could fuse with Dark Arc and give him the power to defeat Dark Gaia. And that means he reverts to being a baby, I guess. I'm still not sure what the hell is happening in this scene. There were lines for various characters that talk about the light and dark sides of Ark as well, from these monks in Lhasa to light and dark Gaia themselves. He's even alluded to once in a book in Sylvain Castle, far before you get any real mention of him or meet him. The world is steadied by a balance of light and dark. When that balance is disturbed, a hero will appear to restore it. The hero will fight courageously with the weapon first held by man. Canon Cycles of Light Arc Failing this one is gonna involve a bit of speculation. While, yes, in-game it's definitely established that there is an ongoing cycle of life, it's never explicitly stated how many times it's happened already. We only know that it's still locked in that cycle, but I think I can see where that comes from. Not much in this game is stated very clearly anyway, so I can go with this. The clock shown in the intro of the game ticks down to its last hour as a brief history of the world is being described. The hands fall and a thirteenth hour appears. When you meet Light Side Arc in-game, he talks about the same idea. Earth's history being likened to a clock and that the 13th hour is a time that must not exist. It may not necessarily mean that there have been 12 cycles with our hero Dark Ark starting the 13th, but it's the idea of things being out of balance. I like this game FAQ's explanation. In Baruka's world, or more accurately Dark Gaia's world, where life does not continue naturally and is instead stagnant because everything lives forever, the world breaks down time can't continue properly past that point because no progress can be made. And it is Light Arc's destiny to die at some point in every life cycle. Light Arc was created by Light Gaia to stop Dark Gaia, Light Arc dies in the conflict, it just keeps happening as Dark Gaia tries to take over the cycle. Light Arc is also within the loop of fate, unlike Dark Arc, who is unique to the cycle happening in the game. So Light Arc is the one that keeps getting reincarnated to fulfill his fate. There isn't just a single grave in Dry Veil for nothing. At least, that's how I interpret things. Hidden Loran scene. Near the end of the trip to Loran, when you're on the side of town where Turbo is, there's a house that seems like all it has is a chest. If you crawl under the table, Yomi will yell out that some zombies are coming and to find a place to hide. If you stay under the table though, this happens. cut off areas of Polynes and Sahara. Polynes and Sahara have one other thing hiding in them. I don't know much about the technical, developmental side of this game, but I would guess it's something to do with that. Most towns or sub areas will let you walk back onto the overworld map if you just go off the screen in any direction. But Polynes and Sahara have a couple of tiles in the top left corner that let you go off screen at a certain distance. The camera will still follow you going left to right, and there are even a couple of objects you can bump into. I have no idea if there are any other areas in the game that are like this, or if there is more planned for these two areas. But I will say, I only came across this info on one site, so holy shit, props to Gurk and Damson here for finding this. 
Dark Gaia Cut Stage Extension. This refers to some unused graphics for the final boss's stage. There's a lot more to the background than the game allows you to see, which is anything above this point. There's the detailed middle cone surrounded by stars, and a repeated top cone, though half of it is missing, and these hanging bits aren't used anywhere else in the game. Along with that, Fujiwara dropped a link on Twitter to a bunch of concept art, and yeah, Dark Gaia indeed had more attacks that weren't in the final game. So who knows how much more elaborate it was supposed to be. For reference, here's the final phase of the fight as well. Ending Bird or Ark. The final cutscene shows Lightside Elle being awoken by a knock at her door in the middle of the night. We don't get to see who was at the door, but it's speculated to be a variety of things. Ark reincarnated as a bird as a gift from Light Gaia, making his dying dream during the credits real. Or it could be Ark himself. After defeating Dark Gaia, Light Ark tells Dark Ark that they must return to their respective worlds. So perhaps Light Ark returns to Elle. Maybe that scene with Elle is just a part of Ark's bird dream. Bird Ark lands in a forest, and you can hear bird calls as Elle answers the door. The crystal theme plays once Elle answers the door, and there's even outside media with its own suggestions. The Tenshi Sozo gamebook illustrated by Kamui Fujiwara himself has this as the end page. Now, this could be part of the dream, or maybe that really is Ark. The book is entirely in Japanese with no translation I could find, so no hints there. I'd like to think that this still says things are open to interpretation though, because first of all, this story has been really confusing for me to piece together, and of course, it's entirely intentional that the ending is open to interpretation. That's part of what makes it so impactful after all. We'll get to that gamebook too, but it doesn't have anything more to do with how the ending goes down, as far as I know. Manga Adaptation Illustrated by Mamiko Yasuka, there's a manga adaptation that covers Terranigma in two volumes. And holy shit, it's actually really good! So, okay, it hasn't been translated to English officially, but there is a fan translation done by a team called Glacial Rebellion of the first volume. The second volume is definitely out there, I did find all of its pages, and it's very cool that this even exists. The second volume doesn't cover the entire rest of the game, it appears to stop after Ark defeats Baruga himself and everyone is back in Krista safe and sound, which is definitely not how things went in the original game, but at least they got a happy ending. Seriously though, if I could tell you to buy this manga, I would. At least go and read it for the sake of the translators, it's got some great moments in it. Lots more personality is given to Ark, I didn't interpret him acting as strongly in the game as he does here since we get these extra moments, but I can totally see him being like this. It follows the plot of the game, albeit with some changes that I feel either couldn't be portrayed in the game due to technical limitations or for the sake of storytelling. Like the whole village is covered in ice instead of just the villagers being frozen, Ark only goes into one tower instead of five, and he does doesn't have to find the giant leaves to swim or the raw dewdrop to fight Parasite. He just has them after almost drowning in one panel and he defeats Parasite by holding his breath even after being covered in poison, but it's whatever. This dude gets fucked up in one panel and then is pretty much fine the next most of the time. And I do mean that, like, I wasn't expecting there to even be blood for some reason, but Man. Okay, so Ark goes off to resurrect the birds, and when he gets to Great Cliff, the demon boss birds are already there, Yomi gets grabbed, and Ark gets grabbed trying to save him. While being held onto by the bird, he cuts its feet off, launches his spear into its stomach, and the other bird attacks Ark, resulting in him losing a foot! But oh my god, dude, it's so good. I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't that. Yasuka's art is also great. Like, like, look at this, look at this. Volume 2, page 42. Oh my god, him, look at him! Sorry, I'm fucking rambling, but this is so cool, and I don't think I'm gonna get to talk about it in any other form, so please, please, links in the description. Also, if you ever wanted to see Ark swear, well, he says damn in hell a few times, so there you go. But come on, let him say fuck! German comic. This one was actually a bit of a journey to try and find. Um, Club Nintendo. It was a bi-monthly magazine in Germany that published from 1989 to 2002. It is different from the discontinued Club Nintendo loyalty service that we had, and really it's a German version of Nintendo Power. These magazines had exclusive comics in them that were drawn by Japanese manga artists, and the stories were thought up by the magazine editors. Somehow, among comics with all the big Nintendo boys like Mario, Link, Kirby, and some otherwise huge characters like Banjo and Kazooie, Terra Enigma got one that attempted to cover a lot of the main story events. These comics were never released in any other form, so of course if you want to read them, you've got to hunt for a fan translation. Someone on Game FAQs had their own translation of the full 32-page comic, but it's a post from 8 years ago that has since had all of its hosted files expire, and they haven't logged in since 2015, so that was a dead end. Someone on Reddit had also posted about the German comic, with someone in the comments offering to translate, but I didn't find anything else from them about that. However, I did find a spreadsheet for all of the Club Nintendo comics, and luckily Terranigmas did get translated. The 
only thing is that it's not the full 32 page comic and the comic itself is really strange. Like the other people in Arcanelle's houses and Krista were just friends or neighbors as far as you could tell in the game, but in the comic, some of them are Arcanelle's parents. Underworld Elle's hair color is also closer to Overworld Elle's hair color or just straight up blonde. And for some reason she's called Saraya. I have no idea where that comes from. She's not called that in any version of Terranigma and her name in the German version is Melina. The translators even acknowledge it at the end of this issue. So yeah, who knows? We're gonna need to go back to that Reddit post though, since the link posted is the only place where you can find the rest of the comic. It progresses really quickly, which is totally fair because there's no way you could fit all of Terranigma into something like this. The parasite fight and the resurrection of birds and animals are all in one panel. Ark immediately finds himself in Eklamata and there's Dark Morph. Oh, uh, we're already in Lhasa and we're running out of time. Okay, exposition dump. Loran and meeting Mei Lin even got Turbo in there. Very next page, we got the looming threat of Baruga and it ends there. It's definitely interesting that this even exists. Like how do they make this happen? Terranigma novels. There are two Terranigma novels. The first one we'll talk about is Light in the Darkness by Kumi Sayori. I don't think either of these novels have any sort of English translation, but at least with Light in the Darkness, Rekka Alexio was again kind enough to share some of it on a Twitter thread. As with the manga, these novels have extra scenes for more characterization. It starts in Lhasa when Ark wakes up after having defeated Dark Morph, but he can't remember anything. Small added details are already present from the beginning, like the girl who took care of Ark in the game is smitten with him here, and it's pointed out that Ark has eyes like Prime Blue aka Magirox. Definitely interesting since he's portrayed with these simple black sort of anime eyes in all of his official artwork. Ark goes to Loran to check on Meilin after Kumari tricks him. Turbo happily greets him, but of course Meilin is not too happy to see him there. Ark is still good natured at heart like he is in the game too, like he can't bring himself to hurt any of the zombies in Loran since he knows they were people at one point. This prompts Ark to be uncharacteristically insightful towards Yomi. It should also definitely be mentioned that Ark does try to remember things. Temjin shows Ark a Magirok and he can feel the power in it, and he knows he should know what it is, and Yomi uses that against him. Laura Castle seemingly pops up out of nowhere and when Ark asks Yomi what he means when he mentions it, Yomi just says, you don't need to know. It's a pretty long novel too. Really the only thing I can find of it are eBay listings, but it says it's over 300 pages. Would love to see where this amnesia plot goes with Ark. The other novel, I'm afraid I don't have as much info on. This one also pretty much only exists as an eBay listing. There are pictures of the cover, even some illustrations like Ark fighting the Shadow Keeper and Perel with Fida in what I would guess to be Dragoon Castle. There's not much else I can find on this particular novel though. I don't know how long it is or even what it's about beyond a near 10 year old forum post. It surely has more background info on certain things just because it is a novel like the post mentions these guys from Sylvain Castle haunting some local village if it was Litz or Loire I'm sure it would have been named but yeah as much as I would love to find out I can't read these books and even if I could I don't know if I'm curious enough to drop a hundred dollars on one Tenchi Sozo Gamebook. This was one of the most elusive entries to find any information on. It's definitely a real book. As far as I looked, I didn't see any posts about it specifically, just sparse shopping listings for it that have a few pictures and mentions from a couple of forums about the ending image because it's still confusing. Cherubay's Terranigma info page by far had the most info on it. Supposedly, it's a choose your own adventure kind of book. I couldn't tell you what's actually in the book. I don't think it's been translated in any fashion. And the most I have to show for it are some of the illustrations, which were done by Fuji himself. Here's a cute one of Ark and Liam. There's Roid being a badass in Dragoon Castle. There's Ark seeing the mirage of El and Leoto. And the last two pictures of it physically are Fida waking Ark to ask for his help and Ark seeing Princess El. Cherubay's site has the rest of the illustrations and some of these would be really cool to see in better quality. The portraits in Sylvain Castle, Dark and Light Ark meeting, and Ark and Yomi getting scared off by a yeti in Eklamata. The book also came with a mini poster of the game's key art and what looks to me like a D&D character sheet? I would guess that's to help keep track of the path you take since this is another long book at 318 pages. It's also supposedly written by Misa Ikeda, though I could only find this on a single site. Terranigma World Atlas. Wouldn't you know it, I couldn't find very much on this one either. And I'm not even sure what it is to be honest. Pictures from sales listings show guides for dungeons, enemy and boss descriptions, layouts of towns, and locations on the overworld map. So, like a guide or a strategy book, right? Well, Terranigma had that already. Actually, I shouldn't say already, it seems like the atlas came out before the official guidebook. I'm not sure what or who Aspect is or if it's a part of the inevitably wonky Google Translate of this archived page, but I'm just going to guess that the Atlas is a third party guidebook. And again, taking the translated text with a grain of salt, their contents seem very similar, not to mention the fact that they came out so close to each other and are similar in length. At the very least though, the Atlas should have illustrations that can't be seen anywhere else. The strategy guide has plenty of full illustrations in it which have been circulating the 
internet for a while, and have since even been posted by Kamui Fujiwara on his Twitter. I couldn't find the atlas in full, but there are some unique drawings in it. Here's a picture of what the Earth and Terra Enigma is supposed to look like. This one is not the same, but similar to part of the bird resurrection sequence. The clash of prehistoric and I want to say modern, maybe medieval would be better here. The epilogue page, which makes me wonder if they're alluding to the entire quintet universe. And finally, what I think is the most interesting find. Something about this is so cool to me. It might be because this is the first time I'm seeing this. It's only in this book as far as I know. Like, I would kill to see this uploaded in high res. And the fact that it shows light and dark art together like that, I don't know. I guess I'm just a sucker for this art trope since I've seen it a lot elsewhere. Ark's original design. Ark had quite a few design iterations as we can see in the concept art link that I mentioned earlier. They're neat, like a couple of these give me Dragon Quest vibes, which is funny since Fujiwara has worked on Dragon Quest manga before. The small details on this make me think of Wander from Shadow of the Colossus. We've even got a younger Ark in what I would guess is a modern version of him. But there's another version of him I want to talk about. <coughs> Yep, that's literally it. Ark was originally intended to have blue hair. Take this with a grain of salt because Google Translate, but the color of his hair and clothes were meant to represent the planet, the blue being the sky or the earth itself, and his clothes being the dirt and magma. I don't know if all the other little details on his clothes are meant to be anything, but it's just cool. He has more intent put into him than I initially thought. His hair was changed to blonde in the final game since it helped him to better stand out against the game's backgrounds. Beta version. Brute Press, a Japanese video magazine centered around video games, showed off a beta version of Terranigma in a July 1995 volume. Plenty of stuff is different, plenty of stuff is there as a placeholder. There are green elements around the HUD that aren't in the final game. This menu is definitely a placeholder. The layout of the first tower is different. In the final game, this room is on the third floor, not the second floor. And Ark is seen climbing the first tower without claws or chains. There are a bunch of magazine screenshots as well, with plenty of differences. The room you enter to resurrect the continents is different in color and has only three doors instead of five. Ark has a green spear against Parasite, even though the only two green spears in the game can't be obtained at this point. This time, he has the claws as he climbs up a tower, and graphical differences on said tower and Parasite. Some areas also look different, like the corner of Krista with the shops had more going on in beta screenshots. This town seems to have gone completely unused, and this crazy looking overworld town. The beta has yet to be found, but it could be out there somewhere. Satella View Demo. October of last year, Chrono Moogle on Twitter found and got a ROM dump of a Satella View demo for Terra Enigma. In case you don't know, the Satella View was basically a subscription based satellite broadcast service for the Super Famicom that allowed for downloads of games, magazines, and extra data for certain games for a limited time. The Terra Enigma demo is perhaps a little disappointing in that it's nothing playable, it simply plays all of the resurrection cutscenes in the game, I guess to show off the technical marvels that they are. That's probably about all you could put on there too, since Terra Enigma is a larger SNES cart, but yeah, it's a thing that exists. <sighs> Eating your husband, oh my god, that's awful! I can't just say that shit! Okay, so Eklomata is a snowy mountain Ark has to climb to resurrect humanity. Near the end of this area, you're sent tumbling through a cave and out into the mountainside. This triggers an avalanche, leaving you and two goats stuck in an icy cave. One goat is already dead, and the remaining goat tells you that was her husband. Darkness falls on the cave, so Ark and the goat huddle for warmth. Once light returns, the goat asks Ark if he's hungry and... Yeah, she offers up her husband to Ark's dismay. He refuses, and the goat is oddly calm about all of this, saying that she has no problem doing it because it's her husband and the world would be less another goat if she didn't. She's a little disappointed Ark doesn't want it, and tells him he'll have to grow stronger to continue traveling his journey alone. After this, she says she's discovered a spot in the wall where it's thin. She rams it, and through the hole... Well, it can't be helped. You have to leave her with only a glimmer of hope that she can make it out herself somehow. You can return to the cave after the resurrection of humanity, but...
Terra Enigma 2. No, there isn't any kind of sequel, unfortunately. But there are a few fan attempts to make a sort of Terra Enigma 2. One is Terra Enigma 2, the continuance by The King or Shade Arc on YouTube, which as far as I can tell, is a fan game made on a custom engine and was planned to be playable in English, but it was put on hold indefinitely. I guess someone else took up the mantle and ported it to RPG Maker? There are videos from someone else on a new engine, and the original creator mentions on some different forum posts that there is an RPG Maker version, but I'm not 100% on the details. And by a different forum post, I mean that there's a German forum dedicated to this game, but I can't access any of the posts without making an account. The game also has a download link, which wouldn't be of much use to me, and clicking the link for it on YouTube... Oh my god, I have never gotten a warning like that. I think I'll pass. Another attempt at Terra Enigma 2 is... this? I think this might be the RPG Maker version. The title screen definitely looks like it. Don't think this is an actual game, they're more like mock-up screenshots? But there's also another RPG Maker fan game called Terranigma Origins, which is supposed to be a prequel about Light Arc, and it's definitely an RPG Maker game. I'm not sure how much deeper I want to go down this 2010s rabbit hole. Virus Asmodeus kills developers. Oh, this one... Let's just say it's a doozy. Late into the game, in Baruga's lab, you can find a computer filled with information Baruga has collected. Some info about the lab, his scientific work, and his plans to build the world into an eternal paradise, one free from death and disease. One page details how, in a previous life cycle, Baruga unleashed an airborne virus onto the world called Asmodeus. This does happen later in the game, but only in Neo Tokyo, and almost every person in the town is wiped off the face of the Earth. The thing that makes this incredibly disturbing is the fact that a sarin gas attack occurred in Tokyo mere months before the game was released. And Quintet was based in Tokyo. I've also seen some mentions of it being a reference to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Very, very disturbing illusions. Astarica. To this day, this scene's significance is hard to determine. In the last stretch of the game, to collect the star stones, one of them is located here, this isolated temple in South America. Ark walks up to a pedestal with a bunch of goblets and, as if in a trance, drinks from one of them. He blacks out and is taken into a vision with all the side characters present. Except that it isn't exactly them, they're all renamed and acting very odd, very out of character. Meiho, or Mela, tells you that there's a yearly ceremony held here. There are six goblets, one of them is said to bring the drinker closer to the gods, any of the others means death. The chosen one to drink from the goblets has to spend a year prior without food or drink, I guess as a way to ascend into godhood. You're a skilled warrior, go check on it for me! You find what looks like El, Royd, and Fida with the goblets, and after El comments on the selfish nature of humanity, she kills Royd and Fida. Ark walks in after watching all that happen, and Elle suggests that he drink a goblet to endure the same suffering she did for a year. He drinks one of the goblets, and the vision ends. The general consensus seems to be that this was a vision of one of Light Ark's past lives, and the characters that we know are stand-ins for who they used to be. That is, if the scene really means anything. It's just so bizarre and trippy that even though what Elle says seems like it could be a message about humans' abuse of power, and Royd and Fida with how love prevails in the end, it could just be something to entirely throw the player off guard. Not all the Starstone quests have some deeper meaning after all, like... I never thought I'd be okay with being robbed. Goddess L, though, that might be an even bigger mystery. What kind of god is she? Is she being influenced by Dark Gaia? Did Dark L inherit her powers from Astarica L? What happened to her after this? Who knows if any of this is important to the overall story. And as a quick side note, it doesn't actually matter which goblet you pick to drink from, all of them lead to the same result. Yomi is Luka. During some of the last cutscenes of the game, Yomi has a final conversation with Ark. At one point, Ark asks exactly what Yomi is. Yomi says, Ark, up to now, you've met countless living things, right? Birds, four-legged animals, even mermaids with flipper tails. All living things evolve the way they are now from one creature. Before evolution started, they all looked like me. Yomi is suggesting that he is Luka, or the last universal common ancestor. Luka is thought to be the organism that all current existing life is a descendant of. Not the first life form, not the origin of all life. It's just a population of organisms that is ancestral to all current life on Earth. I don't think this is important to anything, and it doesn't make much sense anyway since Luka is thought to be a single-celled organism, which Yomi definitely is not. And finally, 
The Demiurge Theory The concept of the Demiurge is a very real one. It's a part of Greek philosophy that was adapted by Plato, and if the Wikipedia page is anything to go by, it is a lengthy concept. I'll try my best to explain it in layman's terms and how it relates to Terranigma's story, but I will say now, I am not a philosopher or a scholar, so I could be a little bit off. The Demiurge is a lower god or deity that is responsible for creating and maintaining the physical world, but it's not that god. He just arranged pieces that were already there. The term was later adopted into Gnosticism, and the Demiurge was then viewed as a force of evil since he inadvertently created a material world, while that god was a force of benevolence. The Demiurge believes he's a higher god than he actually is, and thinks he's acting in the best interest of man. He leaves mankind as ignorant as he is, and thinking he's the only god there is. So Jesus comes in to grant knowledge, or Gnosis, to mankind to break the illusion that the Demiurge created. He recognizes humans as intelligent beings with lots of potential, which the Demiurge does not have. This seems to reflect the story of Light and Dark Gaia as explained in Terranigma's intro. Two gods that created and now maintain the world, one being responsible for the evils of the world and preventing humanity from progressing, and the other making way for intelligent beings. As far as I understand it, I still would not say that Gnosticism is behind a lot of the themes in Terranigma. It's there, but you could argue that for a lot of JRPGs where you punch a flawed god in the face or your character is considered godlike by the end. But it is something to think about. Hi everyone, so uh, I, I don't have a script for this. I figured it would be better to record the outro like after I had done a majority of the editing or after I had finished the video. I still have some stuff to finish, but by the time you hear this, the, the video will obviously already be posted, so it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, uh, first of all, the audio for this video, except for this outro, does sound considerably better than my other videos, and I'm afraid it's probably not going to sound like that for a while, long while. It, it's in my pinned comment. I also addressed in my pinned comment uh, some stuff that I didn't address in the video, some little research mistakes that I made. But yeah, my audio recording situation is a little inconsistent, but it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best. This video was so much research. Like, I'm not saying that my other videos, I, I didn't put a lot of work into them because I did, but this one in particular, like, I spent a way more sizable chunk doing research than anything compared to my other videos. But it was fun, man. It, it was great. It's good to research something you're actually passionate about. I scoured forums for hours, like, trying to piece together the story, making sure everything I was saying was correct, or at least I'm, like, presenting all the information that's there, like, if something is open to interpretation, or, like, covering all the bases on a topic, like, the, the sewer door in Dragoon Castle. Like, the, the two possibilities of what that could have been, and the hidden room that I also found behind the door. Which, by the way, that'll be in the description as well, because I actually found that out through a Game FAQs post. I did not find that out myself. So, like, holy shit, uh, Game FAQs fucking saved my ass during this video. But, uh, yeah, I, I put a lot of work into this video, and I hope everybody likes it. I hope there's nothing I'm majorly wrong on. And, of course, shoutouts to Holy, his Twitch will be in the description. And the Iceberg. Shoutouts to Rekka as well, I'll link her Twitter. Of course, I'm gonna be linking the, the site where it has her translation and all the info about the petition. I'll link her YouTube as well. She does stream, last time I checked, she was streaming the ActRaiser remake, which is actually super exciting in regards to Quintet Games as a whole, having a chance at getting a port or a remake. Yeah, uh, I hope I'm not forgetting anything. I am kind of recording this on a whim. I'm not sure what my next video will be. I don't have any ideas that stick out to me right now. It could just be like a standard other game review, but we'll see what happens. I think I said, I think, I can't talk. I think I said something similar at the end of the El Shaddai video. I don't remember. I don't actually go back and watch them. So yeah, peace out. Hope y'all are doing well.